Welcome to the Ultimate Dentist Podcast. Join us to hear success stories of various individuals and learn clinical and life hacks to help you become the ultimate dentist. Hey everyone, I hope you are all doing great. In this episode, I am going to discuss about assessing restorability. Now, usually when I do lectures, when I'm talking to everyone, I have photographs and we can really look at the photographs and I can give specific advice related to a specific tooth or clinical situation. But this being a podcast, I need to kind of become a little bit innovative. So I will discuss with you my protocol, what I do when I need to restore like a, let's say just a single molar heavily restored tooth. Now something's chipped and now you need to do an assessment whether you you can restore this tooth or not. And what protocol I follow when I am doing that, because this is general day to day dentistry. And we need to be good at doing a single tooth before we even think about full mouth reconstruction. So let's say, imagine you have a molar MODP um, kind of pal- uh, a large amalgam and then a small buccal cusp chips off. And in this situation, there's only half of the buccal cusp left and a little bit of palatal wall left. You don't know whether you can save that tooth or not. And this is kind of a scenario where there's uncertainty. So how would you approach this kind of scenario? So first of all, I generally take a photograph of the tooth. I will sit down with patients, show it to patient that look at how big the filling is. And can you see how small or how little of your own tooth has left? Once that's done, I will have an honest conversation with patient uh, without any sugar coating and tell them possible outcomes and their options. So A being you can do nothing because we all need to legally tell patient that, you know, they can do nothing. So you can tell patient that you can do nothing. But obviously, if they do nothing, the tooth is already broken. It can it can lead to extraction really. The other option is that you would remove the old restoration and really assess whether there is enough tooth for you to do new restoration. Now, uh, considering that, let's say the tooth is vital, you need to discuss with patient that, let's say I've removed the restoration. One scenario could be that tooth, uh, there is not enough tooth and tooth needs to come out. If it needs to come out, then you can leave the space as it is, or you can have a bridge or denture or implant done. And you should discuss a cost and fees, approximate fees of each and every scenario. Because you don't want to start restoration, take the tooth out, and then patients like, oh, and then tell patient that implant's going to be three thousand pounds or something. Then patients like, oh, if I would have known that it's going to be that much expensive, or to try and save the tooth. So you need to make sure you inform patient from the beginning as to what are the potential fees will be related to that tooth. So first off, one one of the scenario is that, you know, you remove the restoration and um, tooth is non-restorable, you take it out and then do a replacement or no replacement. The other option, uh, the other scenario would be that you would remove the restoration and then possibly there is a pulp exposure or symptomatic tooth and patient may need a root canal and then maybe a core buildup and an only or a crown. And that's the second scenario. The third scenario is you remove the restoration and you have enough tooth. There is no pulp exposure. Tooth is not symptomatic. And you can do restoration, um, cuspal coverage restoration, either crown or only. And as I said before, my preferred choice in these scenarios is always only. And I hardly do any crowns for this kind of situation. Most of my crowns are generally when I'm replacing existing crown. Otherwise, for posteriors, it's always going to be on lace as my first choice of option. So in this case, you would tell patient that, you know, you would do an onlay. However, you also need to warn patient, although you may not not need a root canal straight away, you may need a root canal at a later stage because obviously there is a trauma to the nerve, big filling, so nerve can get irritated and you may need a root canal treatment. So that conversation needs to happen before anything. And many times I feel that as a dentist, many dentists, they, they take this upon themselves 
and they obviously want to help patient with everything they can and they don't give patient a realistic picture and you know when the when when things go doesn't go according to plan then they lend themselves into trouble because now they started the treatment so make sure you tell patient upfront and be upfront from the beginning as to what are the scenarios it's much better to be upfront in the beginning and maybe scare the patient uh, if they if they get scared in the beginning before you've done any treatment because that's the best way and best time to you to say look if patients are being unrealistic patients like no i don't want root canal treatment and um, i don't want to take an out and i just want this to restoring that's it you can't promise that and patient want that promise from you then i would not treat that patient because it's just unrealistic you can't expect you can't really predict what's going to happen when you remove the restoration so you need to have that conversation with patient and if you're not going to don't feel comfortable then this is the time to just back off and say oh, i'm not going to do treatment so let's say patient say yes the patient's happy with it to go with it the next thing you need to then do is a, a take a periapical radiograph if you haven't already to assess periapical pathology if there is any pathology in the roots many time when patient has long large restoration then they may need a root canal there and then anyway so um and i'm assuming you would have done that before you had all the discussion with patient but if you haven't for any reason then you need to take a radiograph to assess periapical pathology if patients having some cracked tooth syndrome or some pain in the tooth then use a tooth sleuth in order to check which cusp is fractured now with these kind of patients where there is a cracked tooth syndrome, I always tell patient that, look, what we are trying to do is trying to hang on to the tooth for as long as possible. This tooth is never going to be as good as your normal natural tooth because it's like a cricket bat. When you have a crack in a bat, you can tape around the bat and still maybe use it, but it's not going to be as good integrity wide as your new bat. So your patient needs to be aware of that. Once that crack has happened, there's a bacterial leakage and the nerve can die and they may need root canal treatment and all sorts. So again, you need to let the patient know. If patient has a crack tooth syndrome, which is painful and uh, everything, you know, is symptomatic, I'm then more inclined to give patient a crown just to give this bracing effect uh, in order to hold the tooth uh, from more flexing. However, if it's a small cracks and Un, uh, no, there is no symptoms then there is always you can do onlays and I've done hundreds of onlays like that and they work perfectly fine once you've done all the assessment you're then going to remove restoration and assess the restorability depending on the remaining tooth tissue I hope you are by this time you understand that you know you can't really assess restorability of the tooth without looking at what exactly has left after removal of the old restoration so once you remove all the restoration caries and then you're going to decide whether you are going to restore this tooth by just doing a crown or onlay um, if it's a subgingival caries you're going to remove the caries and then decide whether you're going to deep marginal elevation and then do an onlay which is my preferred way to restore the tooth or you're going to prepare tooth for the crown now imagine in this case you have removed all the amalgam, everything. Now there's a thin buckle and palatal wall left. Now, if you start, even if you do restoration and start, you do core and then start drilling the tooth around, you are really actually removing patient's own natural tooth, which is really precious. So, and you will be weakening the tooth no matter what. Even if your core is solid, hard, the crown will come out with the core uh, when it fails. So it's better to try and consider doing onlay rather than a crown in that scenario but then i'm biased because this is what i do um, but if you're comfortable doing crown then that's fine but this is this is the, the these are the steps i will be following now if i'm not sure about the palpable symptoms of the teeth then i would probably keep patient in provisional especially if i'm doing crown if i'm doing onlay i do um, hybrid composite onlay so the blocks like sarah smart and you can easily go through that block and then do a root canal and fill it up with composite and that will work fine so i'm not really worried about doing onlays uh, about symptomatic being tooth being symptomatic later on but if you're doing porcelain crown or porcelain onlay then you know it's not ideal to drill through the newly 
prepared only. So in that case, you may want to do a core buildup and let uh, the, the wait if you if you're really worried about the symptoms. However, it's better to literally protect the tooth straight away. Otherwise, while you're waiting, patient can break and then you lose the tooth. So this is my protocol for general restorability assessment. Now, once you have done the restoration, let's say core buildup or deep marginal elevation, don't forget to take another uh, x-ray to make sure that there is no gaps under your restoration, especially when you do deep marginal elevation, because you don't want to do the crown and only everything. And then there is a gap under the restoration. And, you know, if you're doing lots of, I mean, I, again, I've done over a thousand uh, DMEs in my career. And, you know, when you do enough, you will learn from your mistakes. And I have done that mistake where I've bonded the onlay and, you know, everything looked really good. And then patient came back six months later. And for some reason, I took a radiograph and I can see gap. And and that was a gap. The reason being that I've now then dismantled everything. I've removed everything. And I could see that the, the there is a gap. There was no caries. So since then, I always take radiographs because even though you, you're 100% sure that everything's good, there's always a small chance that it's not really adapted. Now, many times for deep margin elevation, people use like a, a highly filled flowable composite like GUI uh, from GC injectable. I tend to use heated composite that works really well. But yes, you can use um, sort of a highly injectable um, flowable composite as well if you want to avoid having that gap. Just make sure that you don't incorporate bubbles because one of the issues with those syringes is they can have bubbles. So make sure that you don't incorporate bubbles while you're doing that air bubbles. So that's what that was for a single tooth. Now, how does that fit into my full mouth reconstruction protocol? Now, if you haven't yet listened to my episode, early episode, where I've gone through the whole step-by-step -step methods of full mouth reconstruction, the one which I follow for adhesive full mouth reconstruction, then I would advise you to go through that again and then come back to this section so that you understand what I'm talking about. But basically, I would carry out restorability assessment um, during my treatment, during my step one, which is a diagnosis and treatment planning step where I have removed everything and um, I have, you know, decided that I'm going to do an indirect restoration or direct restoration at that point. So treatment and diagnostic phases where I'm really not sure what kind of restoration that tooth will need. However, most of the time when I know that I can restore that tooth, although I wasn't, I would not be sure whether it's indirect or direct, I would leave it till step three. So I would have done anterior buildup. And again, I'm talking about posterior, posterior teeth. Now, if there's anterior teeth involved, then you may want to remove all the restoration and do composite restoration and then do step two at the same, uh, at the same time or later on. But posteriorly, it makes a lot of difference. The reason being that, as you know from the protocol, we are going to do a second wax up after we've done anterior buildup of step two. Now, and then we're going to use stamp technique in order to build our occlusal um, aspects of the teeth. Now, if you go a class two or MOD amalgam, it may be worth removing that amalgam and replacing with composite if you're going to do stamp technique. Um, so, bef and before the wax up, so if, let's say I've got MOD or MOD, it's not a big, it's not like we don't need to really assess the restorability, but I'm going to use stem technique. Then I would, what I would do is I would do anterior buildup, upper and lower three to three. And then I would restore those posterior teeth, um, remove the amalgam and restore them with composite in current OVD, i.e. in ICP, at the same level and then take the impressions for second wax up. So then when the wax up comes back, I literally need to stamp the, the occlusal morphology onto the teeth rather than removing all the amalgam and redoing everything and then stamping because that makes your life much more predictable, easier if you've done that already before you are doing posterior reconstruction. So I hope 
that was helpful if you you know the with regards to this incorporating your core investigation i started doing core investigation when i started doing full matrix construction 13 years ago we i used to do core investigation before any of the start of the full matrix construction cases and that is that is an ideal way to do it however for practical reasons um if you want to save time and if you want to sort of keep keep going and don't waste too much patient's time because when you're doing core investigation patient do not see anything happening most of the time because it's posterior teeth and if you build the anterior teeth and then if you do posterior core investigation then at least patient has a nice smile anterior teeth, and they they feel that things are happening so again in private practice or in in the practice where you're doing treatment privately um, because less like full mouth reconstruction you need to manage patient expectation and you need to make sure that the steps are involved are within that expectation within a limit obviously you don't want to bend over backwards and change the rules of dentistry but this is this is one thing i think you can do easily and change it so i hope it was helpful if you have any questions please follow me on facebook and leave me a, a message or email me at info at drdevankpatel.com mm -hmm.